fellow at the Institute of Math Science. Uh, and then uh, she joined uh, uh, this university. Uh, she did a PhD from IOP Bhuvaneshwar um, and her research interests uh, revolve around basically quantum matter, um, low dimensional system, uh, quantum transport in low dimensional systems, um, uh, conformal field theory applications uh, in low dimensional systems, uh, quantum many body physics, uh, quantum walks these days. Um, and also now she is looking at, in recent times, she is looking at quantum many body physics from quantum information perspective. Um, uh, with that introduction, uh, I will request uh, Professor Durga Nandini to uh, present her talk. Uh, she will be talking about a generalized hydrodynamic description of the long time dynamics of an extended single particle walk. Uh, Durga, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sorin, for that very formal introduction. Yeah, it's a, we are supposed to do that. So. <laughs> okay, was, all right. It's a little strange to hear it, but anyway. I was given instructions. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you for following instructions. <laughs> all right. Can you uh, see the screen? Yes, yes, very much. All right. So I just added this word quantum just to make it clear that I'm talking about the quantum work today. All right. All right. So today, we, uh, let me just say that this was based on work which I've done with my students, uh, Himalata Bandari and Pradeep Thakur at the uh, physics department in Pune University. And it's more or less on these works. And I'd also like to thank the CRP for their funding. And the uh, outline of the talk is essentially this, that I'll make a sort of an extended introduction where I'll be talking about how I got motivated to do this. As uh, Sauron said, that my interest was actually in dimensional correlated systems. So I was interested in spin chain systems, but spin chain systems can be mapped into tight binding Hamiltonian systems and tight binding Hamiltonian systems can be mapped to quantum walk problems. So at least I'll very briefly indicate how it's done. And then I'll get into now consider, think of it as a quantum work problem. And essentially what we are interested in is asking what is a long, what, how does this quantum worker behave or what is the dynamics of this quantum worker at very long times. And what I will show is that long times you have ballistic propagation and a light bond run structure. And I also show that there is universal features in the long time dynamics. So away from the fronts, you have an Euler type hydrodynamic description. And if you're very close to the front, I show that you have universal multi-critical subject Joseph scaling, which is which leads to very interesting connections with other kinds of models, especially the multi-critical random matrix models, or the Gaussian unit ensemble of multi-critical random matrix models. And finally, I'll come back. So let me begin. So the random work problem I found out is actually more than 100 years old. So it started with Pearson who posed this problem. He said he actually wanted to talk of a walker who takes a few steps and then goes in another direction. So it was not really a one dimensional walk. It was a, it's a 3D walk. So it takes, she takes a few steps then again goes at some angle, she, which is also chosen randomly. And then again, makes them in number of steps and then ask what happens to this walker after a long time. Okay, so in this 100 years, of course, a lot has been worked or done on this classical work problem. And essentially, the classical work is simply a random process. It is described by a path, and it consists of a succession of random steps on a network. And here you define the worker, or you describe the worker by definite states. For example, here, these are the definite positions of the worker. And the randomness arises in how you make the transition from, say, from this position to this. So essentially, and that randomness is uh, attributed to the stochastic nature of whichever process you want to describe through this random uh, work problem. And of course, the classic example is the so-called classical drunkard's work. So basically, the drunkard starts, say, at this position, the origin, say, which I put in here. And then she has to decide whether she has to go to the right or to the left. And then you toss a coin, which will be, so if the probability point, if it's an unbiased point, then if suppose you take a hit, so that means your P is half, then you go to the right, otherwise you go to the left, 
and then you ask what is the probability the walker is in position uh, x equal to m up to some capital number of m stars. And then, of course, one gets the well known binomial distribution. And if you go to very large, I mean, if you, if you find out what is the position after a large number of steps, then you find that this binomial distribution goes into the well known Gaussian distribution. And so, if I start, or, or and in the process, it means that the walker has moved the mean distance, which is proportional to root n, because that's for the mean for the Gaussian, and the spread of the walker, or the distance over which the particle has walked, or the which has moved is <coughs> root n, or delta x square is root of. So essentially, it means that the walker propagates diffusively. And that's this is the Gaussian distribution for different steps. So you can see that the walker is basically diffusing across the lattice. Now let's ask what happens in the before I ask that. So this is, of course, a typical uh, way we would describe Brownian motion or random motion molecules in a medium and so on. And as I said, classical random walks have been used in a very diverse variety of physical systems and phenomena to describe stochastic processes. And they've also played an important role in modeling and development of stochastic algorithm design. But now we come to the quantum work. So this idea was proposed by Arnold Davidovich and Zaguri in 1993. So it's really strange. It took 90 years for them to think of a quantum work. So obviously, it was simply that you replace the classical particle by a quantum particle on the network. So once you do that, then the worker is described by a quantum mechanical wave function. And once I have this quantum mechanical wave function to describe my particle, it means that I already have randomness present because you know that the wave function is having a probabilistic interpretation. Then we have linear superposition of states, tensor products of states, collapse of wave functions. So even there is, even although we don't have any randomness in the system, just the quantum mechanical notions lead to randomness. And of course, you can always introduce additional randomness through stochastic processes. So again, if you look at what is the counterpart, the quantum counterpart of the classical drunkard's work, then it is this, where you now have a quantum coin. And suppose I choose this quantum coin to be, say, a two-dimensional one. So it acts now on a Hilbert space, and it can be either, say, like this, what I would call as half or say, in this state. And given some initial state, so the, now the initial state is a tensor product of your position state, which is now a sketch in the Hilbert space, in the quantum Hilbert space, times the state of the coin. And the next step will be then defined by a shift operator, which will act on both the position part as well as on the coin. And so you will get something which is a superposition like this. And if you look at what happens. Okay, and once you know the wave function, of course, one knows the probability because it's mod size square. So you can ask now, what is the probability of finding the particle at some position x after some n number of steps? So you'll find that the, the probability will be then the sum of the probabilities. Of, this actually should be this up and down. And you'll find that it will be a sum of these quantities. So to describe how it differs from the classical work, I'll show this cartoon. So we started with this quantum walker here, but now the superposition essentially, what this means is that the particle is now superposed in both these positions. So it's really the next step is that you consider the particle to be existing in both these steps. And then that the next step poses all of these three positions and so on and so forth. And therefore, during the evolution, the quantum mechanical wave function describes the walker spreads over different positions and you essentially have the system in a superposition of all possible parts so you can get quantum interference effects coherence effects and that leads to a very different final probability distribution from the classical work and for example so the classical work you had this kind of a gaussian profile and if you look at the quantum drunkard's work you will find that you have this very different kind of a profile so you have this kind of a front behavior and also you can see that the spread is much much larger compared to the classical work. in fact what we'll see later is that this spread will be linear whereas this classical work the spread was of root times root times n here it will be the order of n so what this will also indicate is that while the long time dynamics for the classical workers motion is diffusive the quantum particles motion is balanced and why are we interested in even studying quantum work problems so firstly, of course, if you do this kind of theory, you can understand various quantum mechanical concepts like wave particle duality, coherence, decoherence, and so on. And today they've become important because they allow for a wide variety of applications, which 
benefit from this underlying quantum mechanics and especially in quantum information science, the feature of the enhanced threading and faster propagation led to the use of modeling and design of quantum algorithms. And the coherence properties leads that you can use the quantum works for modeling coherent processes like energy transport and photosynthesis. And in recent years, it has also been realized that quantum works can be used to simulate a diverse variety of many body phenomena like Anderson localization, relativistic effects, topological phases, and so on. And experimentally, of course, also it's experimentally also they have been realized in a very wide variety of systems, trapped ions, can EQD, photon wave light arrays, and various other BCs, ultra cold atoms, and so on. Typically, they are studied in two forms, discrete time and continuous time, which where the only difference is that how you describe the time evolution, that whether you do it in discrete time steps or whether you do it as at any continuous time. And continuous time quantum works, which will be the focus of this talk, are usually modeled as Hamiltonian systems defined on a special lattice. And, and just to give you an idea that why, a, I mean, how we can con consider a quantum work continuous time quantum work as a many body system, I would say that suppose you have a chain of spins arranged like this, where you have see down spins at every other lattice point, except the, at the origin where you have an up spin, you can show that we can mod map this into a single particle quantum work. Essentially, you can say that you have one single excitation because each of these can be, because you have spin halves, so it can be either up or down. So I can think of these as qubits or two level systems. And essentially, then I will say that this is the propagation of this single particle. And the dynamics is determined by the Hamiltonian for the coupled two level system or the two. So two levels and two and spin half I use in an analogous way or equivalent. Okay. So that's how we map a quantum work problem into a many, or in this case, a spin half problem. Okay. Now the study of the work dynamics is inherently a non-equilibrium study. Why is it in a uh, non-equilibrium? Because your density, because your, for example, if you started with a worker simply at the origin, it means that you have an inhomogeneous density distribution and therefore the density distribution will change with time and therefore it's a non-equilibrium problem. And typically in a non-equilibrium problem, the interesting questions are what is the nature of propagation? What is the speed at which it propagates? What is the long time behavior? Does the system reach a steady state? And if it reaches a steady state, what are the nature? What's the nature? What are the characteristics? Are there any universal features? That means model independent features in the long time dynamics. And answering these questions would help us to understand fundamental questions in non equilibrium physics, like how systems approach equilibrium, transport processes, and also hopefully, and various other processes, and also will hopefully also allow us to connect to experimental studies on non equilibrium dynamics. And in this talk, Basically, I'm going to use a particular continuous time quantum work and address some of these issues. And the particular one which I'm going to use is a spin chain system. And I will just give a very brief motivation about why I want this particular spin chain system. So we were, okay, uh, we were actually studying um, spin half Heisenberg chains in the presence of what is known as a Zeloshinsky Moria interaction, which essentially comes because of spin orbit coupling at the microscopic level. And this term, the SM cross SM term, was interpreted by Katsura, Balatsky, and Nagosa as an electric polarization to explain the absorbed ferroelectricity in some non collinear magnetic ferrostats. And interpreting this D, then, I mean, so if this is an electric polarization, then we can think of this strength, the Zeloshinsky Moria vector, as an electric field. So we interpreted that as an electric field, and then we asked what is the effect of adding this term on the phases the entanglement factorization and various other properties of the spin chain. And among many other things, we found that if you have this external field, I mean, if you think of it as an external field, then it induces a magnetoelectric effect. Magnetoelectric effect means that the electric polarization gets affected by magnetic field and the magnetization gets affected by electric polarization. But then this is an induced one because of the presence of the external field. So we asked the question, can you have spontaneous magnetoelectric effect? And Okay, we came across this model by Suzuki, who introduced these in 1971. So you have this usual Heisenberg spin half chain, but now you have these extra terms where you have multi spin interactions, you have three spin interactions, and they are of this particular form. And although this Suzuki introduced this in the context of integrable models, uh, later people found that this model has very interesting face uh, diagrams. 
and in particular it shows a non trivial magnetoelectric effect and the recently what we showed is that if you take both of these into account the a and the b terms then we get a non trivial uh, orbital antiferroelectricity and a higher dimensional magnetoelectric effect and that's because you find that even though it's a 1d problem we get some kind of circulating spin currents you know there's a chiral vector phase with circulating spin currents all right so then we led that led us to ask the question okay among some other some other problems which are studying that we know that well solving this we know that by using what is called as a jordan wigner fermionization we can convert the spin hamiltonian into a fermion hamiltonian where these are c's and c daggers are uh, fermion annihilation and creation operators and this gr and e to the power of i phi r so this is now because motivated by this extended or multi spin interaction we considered now the spin chain with say a finite range of interactions and g will denote the strength the phi denotes the phase so basically i'm now thinking of complex uh, hoppings but it's still a hermitian hamiltonian and further if you write this in the first quantized form you will find that the position space wave function satisfies this equation of motion so basically then i have this model that now i have a walker or a particle which can hop say up to maximum number of m sites and the probability or the strength for its hopping is given by this gr and the phase is given by phi so then we can ask the question now given some initial state what is the nature of the particle's propagation at long times is it diffusive is it ballistic what is the spread what are the uncertainty fluctuations and how this in this particular case we can also ask how does the propagation depend on the competing hopping strengths and the phases so the main thing is then to solve that uh, equation of motion which means you must get the wave function because we know in quantum mechanics if i have the wave function then i have it, i know everything about the system so basically compute the time involved wave function one way will be or the best way to do because we have a lattice equation so can do a fourier transform and get it into this form and in the long time limit this will become the sum will become an integral so then the best so one way would be that okay just integrated numerically but we also can um, we have also done an analytic calculation for in general for any arbitrary uh, range we cannot give it because the psi of qt here you have this omega q so you have this uh, sum of these cos functions so we cannot integrate this exactly so we have here but we can still do an analytic uh, evaluation of the integral using what is known as a stationary phase separation and the results which i will be showing will be using both of these so let's take the simplest case where i allow my particle just to go to the next step there's no other extension then we can solve the problem exactly because your omega will be simply cos q we will get the answer for the wave function in terms of bessel functions then we get the probability density as mod of the bessel functions and then if you plot this you will simply get a picture like this this is at some time t equal to 50 so what you can see from this profile the local probability density profile is that there is this kind of sharp fronts which are bounding the propagation and then in within the front region you find you have oscillatory behavior and outside of the front region you have exponential decay and if you do this for different times you will find that typically the spread is given by approximately p times t where p max is the maximum velocity which you can get i'll just talk about it but the main point is that the spread is linear in time and i'm showing you this this is an experimental realization of a quantum warp in a photon wave like or in a wave like lattice by injecting photons so the injected light here and then this light or the photon propagates and you can see that okay i'll show this or this is actually the propagation you can see this kind of front propagation i'll come back to this again so now we can ask the question that what happens if i extend the hopping that is if i allow it to go to more than one uh, next near, to the next nearest sorry the nearest neighbor side i take the simplest extension that i allow the particle to hop also to the next nearest neighbor side so this was when there was no just nearest neighbor and now what i've shown on the right side is the uh, densities as a function of time so you can really see that as the particle propagates it's really a causal propagation and this you can see is very much similar to what is shown here but now if i have this three are for the case when you have there is only real hopping strength and we are only considering next nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor you can see that there's a distortion of the thing as a function of the nearest neighbor coupling strength so as i increase the nearest neighbor strength i still have causal propagation 
but you can see some nice internal structures. So for example, at a particular strength, G equal to one fourth, you get suddenly another internal sharp front. And then if I increase further, now you find that there are two other internal fronts. So we do have causal propagation, but there is still some structures which appear as a function of the competing or uh, hopping strength. So this is what I've shown you. And so essentially it means that the number of cones you have so I'm going to say that this is also like a, some kind of an internal cone will depend upon the strength of the uh, next nearest to the strength. So now if I introduce also a complex phase, so this we have done for pi to pi by two, and I'm still starting with an unbiased state. So I've localized my, my particle initial state is unbiased. I started with the particle at just the origin, but now you see that immediately once I introduce complex hopping, I get an asymmetric pro propagation. Although I still get causal propagation, but the causal propagation is asymmetric. And again, as I increase the strength of my, here again, I've taken the simplest expression. As we increase the strength of the couplings, you'll find that there's a particular strength. This actually is the strength at which you'll find that there's a sudden change which will happen. And beyond this strength, you'll find that now uh, new causal structures appears. But in, but in this case, what you will see is that, so this causal structure is different from this causal structure. Here we are symmetrically, uh, cones, two nested cones, but in this case we have two cones, but these are actually overlapping cones. The left, of, the left fronts for both of them are, um, um, they fall on each other. Okay, so the next question then is that, so, so this tells you that therefore the causal structure exists, but the causal structure will depend upon your complex hopping strengths and phases, uh, the strengths and the phases of your next nearest structure. But then the question comes that, okay, can we understand why do I have this front behavior and why is it that I get these kind of internal structures up here? So for that, it's useful to do the analytics calculations. So then we use the stationary phase approximation. So essentially you evaluate this Fourier integral by using going to the stationary point solutions, which essentially says that the derivative of this phase must be zero. And given that the phase is given in this form, n by t minus omega q, it simply says that the solutions are n by t must be equal to v of q in star. So the dominant contributions then at large times will come from the stationary state solutions or the solutions given star which satisfy this condition. And so you can write your wave function then as a superposition of the solutions over all the saddle point solutions. And if you look at this here, then you find that if I look at this part, I have now a plane wave i n q n star e to the power of minus i q n star. So this implies essentially that the maximum contribution comes from ballistically propagating fronts. And then you have an amplitude part here, which is proportional to one by modulus root of the modulus of the derivative of the velocity at q n star. So the stationary phase approximation tells us that you have ballistic propagation of left and right moving fronts because left and right because velocities can be plus or minus. And further because your dispersion is of this form. It means because you have a cost function here, it means it's bounded dispersion. So your front velocity, which is the derivative of this is also bounded. So therefore we have this lead Robinson bounds on the maximum and the minimum which this velocity can have. And if I go back now and ask what are the solutions here, the static point solutions, what you will find is that if your N is lying between this N max and in, in min and in max, where in max and in min are given by v max and v min t, then your q n stars are real. And in that case, I'm going to get oscillatory solutions for, because this part will be oscillatory if q is real. On the other hand, if your n is greater than your n max, or if it's n is less than n min, then my q n star will become imaginary and I'll get an exponentially decaying solution. And that is the reason actually why we have this front propagation in this problem that the existence of Lee Robinson bound. So although we had a non-relativistic system, but your dispersion is bounded and therefore we get this kind of a causal propagation. We can also further see one more thing from here that the amplitude depends upon the on the one by root of the derivative of the velocity. So if this derivative blows up, then you can imagine that something can happen to the wave function. Something drastic can happen to the wave function or it can become singular. And essentially that's what happens. So we can actually classify fronts by some number k, where k will define 
or k plus 1 actually is the number at which the first non-zero derivative of v of q occurs. And here we are only considering q equal q real. And if you have ordinary fronts, in which case that means your v of v2, that is the first derivative of v is not zero, so there's no singularity in the wave function, then we call that as an ordinary front. Otherwise, the first derivative is zero, and it means that the wave function becomes singular, we'll call all those solutions q's as extremal fronts. So k is greater than or equal to one. So basically then the reason why we get in the extended quantum work problem is of additional fronts is because this solution allows for solu allows or this dispersion allows for solutions where your uh, v of q can vanish at more than two points. Typically in the nearest neighbor walk, v of q vanishes, or sorry, v prime of q, because it's simply cos q, v prime of q will vanish only at q equal to plus or minus pi by two, and therefore we simply have two fronts. So always you can see that the fronts traveling with the maximal or the minimal group velocity, that's because by definition, they are always going to be extremal fronts because if you're saying it's a maximal or the minimal group velocity, the derivative must vanish. But in addition now, you can say for the extended quantum box, we can get higher order, higher fronts. And you can then see, all right, I'll come back to this little later, but I'll just mention it quickly here, that the wave function now, if you look close to a kth order front, it will not have a one by t behavior. So at an ordinary front, you will find that, for, again, from here, you will simply find that you have a one by t behavior. If I take mod size square, so it's one by root t, mod size square will have a one by t behavior. But if I look close to a front, I will have this one by t to the power of one by t plus two. So if k is not the ordinary front, I will get a subdiffusive behavior for the wave function, or for the problem constant. All right. So essentially then from this local property density profiles for an extended walk with nearest neighbor and extended nearest neighbor hopping, what we find is that you have causal propagation and the number of light cones will depend upon the next nearest neighbor hopping strength as well as the phase. And even though I also should mention that even though we started here with an initially unbiased state, we get still a biased propagation. And in particular, if you look at the front structure, I mean, if you look at the nature of the fronts, what we find is that the maximal fronts are always, at least for the real case, for the real hopping case, that the maximal fronts are always first order. And the internal front exactly at GC where the transition occurs, that's a second order front, while the extent at once it crosses and you get these uh, two cones, then again, they are first order fronts. But if you look at the case where you had phi equal to pi by two, then you find that at GC, there's only one causal cone, but it is still a critical point because you'll find that one of the extremal fronts or one of the maximal fronts is first order while the other becomes now a third order. All right, that's so much about the local property density profiles, but now we can just ask, can I describe, because you can already see once I have this kind of ballistic propagation, it tells you that there should be some kind of scaling in my problem. So we can ask that, can I see the scaling to some quantities? And if I look, look again at the stationary ways uh, solutions, and what you will find is that, I will skip this part. If you look at the cumulative property densities and the cumulative current densities, which I defined like this, it's less like how we define cumulative property in our classical property distributions. You will find that these cumulative probabilities have a global scaling form. That means they are not dependent on NNT separately, but simply on the scaling variable n by t. And similarly, the current, the cumulative current also depends only on n by t. And in fact, what you can find is that various other physical observables like the cumulative position moment, the entanglement entropy and others also have such a global scaling form. And as I said, this is simply because of the fact that you have ballistic propagation in the bulk. Okay, and in fact, if you take again the nearest neighbor form, you can get a very simple global scaling form for the cumulative property distribution. And it's simply given by this, that if you're inside the allowed region, it has this sign inverse of n by v is the same as v max of n by t up to a constant. And here I plotted this. So you see that it has this kind of a flag profile outside of the, so the cumulative property, if you look, it has a flag profile outside of the causal pool, and then it has this sign inverse form inside the causal pool. And similarly, I can also plot the, I can also find the current cumulative current density, which again will show a flag profile outside the pool, and it has this kind of a semicircular distribution inside. And I should just mention here that this 
uh, cumulative, these profiles are exactly like the magnetization profiles obtained from the time evolution of an initial domain world state for the spin half Gesenberg X exchange. And this is for the current density or the current transport. And it's not a surprise because you can actually map the problem into the X exchange with the domain. Okay. Now you can again go back to this extended work problem and ask well, how do these profiles look for the CPD. So in this case, we don't get closed forms, but we can actually get the forms by solving the saddle point solutions numeric or graphically by using this QV curves, because essentially you see the stationary point solutions was V of Q equal to N by Q. So I have to just invert them. So from that, I can get the densities. And then again, you can see that, okay, we are actually we have compared both our theoretical scaling curves obtained from saddle point with the numerical things. And you can see that the phi's are just functions of N by Q. So they are scaled. And further, you can see that the CPDs start to show signatures of the phase transitions. I'm calling this as a phase transition because one can actually see that this can correspond to the phase transition, the corresponding spin model. So you can see that as, as G at G equal to GC, the CPD shows a spike, a sudden spike, and then it branches off like this. And once I go to G greater than GC, then you have these two spikes. Basically, this correspond to the emergence of two nested cones and here it was that one sharp cone at the or, or a sharp front occurring at the origin and again here as i said that we can't we don't have closed forms but it's possible to graphically get the, uh, the scaling forms if i put now uh, introduce a complex phase then you will again find that you can get scaling but again as I, again what you will find is that these are asymmetric as you can see but you can also see that the nature of the front can be seen here. You can see that, I mean, it's not very obvious. We'll see it more obviously a little later, but already you can see that the nature of the front is different here for the G equal to 1 8th, 1 16th case as compared to the G equal to 1 8th case. It already shows that something different is happening at G equal to GC. And then if I cross G greater than GC, then again, I have find that I'm opening up another front, but this also shows, see this curve is quite different from this curve. Here you can see that you have two, I mean, this CPD will correspond to the emergence of two nested cones, whereas this is, shows the emergence of two partially overlapping cones. Okay. So now that we have got this hydrodynamic uh, ballistic propagation, then we can ask, okay, do we have, we can we write down some kind of Euler like hydrodynamic equations? And in fact, we can show that a local density is, which we, is a function of both Q and N satisfies an oil like equation essentially as i said the whole thing is because of the ballistic propagation and using that we can write down a whole series of continuity equations of this form there's an infinite number of such conservation laws so therefore the long term um, description of the state can be determined by these set of infinite conservation laws and the lowest of this set is nothing but the conservation of property or the conservation of the cumulative property so therefore, what we find, therefore, is that at centrifugal large distances in time, you have a quasi-stationary state described by an infinite set of conservation laws. Okay, so if I just pause and ask now, what did we learn from this stationary phase description? Is that you have a ballistic propagation with causal life cone structure. You can describe the system by quasi-stationary state, which is characterized by an infinite set of Euler type conservation laws. And further, that you have hydrodynamic signatures of quantum phase transitions because it will show both in the number of light points, how, what kind of, I mean, the number of light points which will emerge, and it will also show up in the different nature of, or the, sorry, the different nature of the transition and the critical couplings also is captured by the hydrodynamic. Because you'll find that at, for real near this neighbor hopping, you'll find an internal second, second order front emerges, which you know, if you do the calculations, you'll find that. On the other hand, if I look at complex nearest neighbor hopping with phi equal to pi by two at GC, you will find that one of the maximal fronts becomes a third order front. And that is precisely what we are seeing here. That this is a third order front I mean, that we can actually see from the saddle point solutions, whereas this corresponds to a second order front. So the hydrodynamics or the bulk scaling already gives us an idea about the phase transitions associated with this model. From this, we can also see that if you look very close to the front, so you find that it's not really a function of n by t. There is a deviation from this n by t scaling. So if you want to understand that better, 
then we go and see again the wave function at a site in near a kth order front. And what you can show is that the wave function near an kth order front can be written like this. So you have got this ballistic part, or or sorry, yeah, of, yeah, the plane wave kind of part, but in terms multiplied with this amplitude function, and interestingly, this amplitude function satisfies a nonlinear equation of this form. And if you look at the k, when k equal to one, the, the first order external front, your a1 tilde satisfies a very familiar nonlinear equation, which is the, uh, but the linearized version of this, the linearized k2 equation. So, okay, so then if I look at, and then you can ask the question, okay, now that I know the wave function using the stationary phase approximation, very close to the front, and if I ask, how does the CPD behave? Because we already saw that it didn't follow the n by t scaling. So we define the deviation of the CPT near the front and as a difference of the CPT at the position n minus the value at the front itself. And interestingly, you can find that this delta phi can be expressed in terms of these functions, AKs, which are products of those AK stars. AK stars and the A tildes are related by this one by t to the power of one by k plus t factors. So, and it this kk function, it only depends upon the scaling variable, which is now not n by t, but it's n minus n by e by t to the power of 1 by k plus 2. There's a factor here, but you can forget about that, t to the power of 1 by t. So what it means is that when you're close to the front, distances to the front scale as 1 by t to the power of 1 by k plus 2. And since this part is only built, uh, dependent on the scaling variable, what it tells us is that your delta phi now scales as t to the power of 1 by k plus 2. Yeah. So you're going to get an anomalous scaling near the front. And even more interestingly, these AK functions, these are nothing but generalized airy kernels for when K is odd, and they are what are known as generalized PRC kernels when K is even. So if K equal to one at a first order front, K1 is a very familiar airy kernel. And for K equal to one or K equal to two, the lowest one, it is known as the PRC kernel. And from the asymptotics of these kernels, and or equivalently from those A's, we can actually then find out what is the scaling behavior of the scaled CPD or the deviation of the CPD. So I've taken T to the power of one by K plus T times delta phi. And what you will find is then that the scaled CPD will go as mod xi to the power of one by K plus one for K odd up to a factor of minus one by five and same the factor for the even part, but only thing is that you have an additional two factors. So, to summarize, it says that the scale CPD is proportional or scales with an exponent of one by k plus one for both odd and even. And further, it also says that because this kappa k actually will depend upon the details of the coupling, but since the scaling exponent is only dependent on the order, it means that it's universal. It doesn't depend really on what phi is or what phi is. And here I've demonstrated the universality at a first order front. So this is for g equal to zero because we had the maximal front wave first order. So you can see that this goes as i to the power of half. And uh, all of these actually go as i to the power of half, but I've shown them differently, but they all actually map onto each other. So it means that it doesn't depend upon what value it is. It's just that the fact that it's a first order front which matters. And now since we also had second order front and third order front in our problem, we can ask that does that follow the, this um, expected value that this should go as one third for the second order front? The scale CPD must scale like this, while for a third order front, it shows it should go as one fourth. And again, one finds exactly that kind of behavior. And again, I should mention that this is at large size. So we find very good matching with our theoretical stationary result and the uh, numerical calculations. Uh, this is, of course, up to somebody uh, wants to. But you can also see that here from the third order front, there is some kind of an internal structure here, which we can see. On the other hand, we don't see an internal structure here. Again, the first order front showed some internal structure. So you can ask, okay, can we probe that internal structure further? And we can again go back and find out what is the CPD in terms of those A's. So the scale CPD can be written in terms of those airy, generalized airy functions, because this happens only for odd order fronts. So they are the generalized airy functions. And you can see that if your AK, the first and the second derivative of delta phi will vanish at the real zeros of the AK functions. And so the real zeros of the AK functions will correspond to stationary inflection points of delta phi, phi and that leads to a state case behavior near the front. And again, because you've uh, described everything in terms of this scaling variable, it means that the 
this scaling structure as well as the area under the steps must remain a universal unit constant. And I've shown this only for the first order, but we actually also have this for the third order. That this area. So we uh, we calculated this numerically, and you can see that the area under the steps, whether you have g equal to 0, 1, 8, 1, 4, as long as it's the first order front, the step, the area under the steps is more or less one. This numerically at some times 5010. So we have this universal internal staircase structure here and what are the front. But then we also ask the question that why is it that I didn't get an internal staircase structure near a second order front? Okay. So if you look at what the CPD or the deviation of the CPD near a second order front, it's given by this function where this i is this integral. This is a2 actually, the your C function. And our conjecture is that. The reason we don't get a staircase structure is because that this function does not have any real zero. I should write here real zeros. And because it does not have real zeros, therefore we don't get a staircase structure. And we also ask the question that does this then indicate uh, localization? And to find this out, because we've got the second order front at the transition g equal to gc in our real um, extended nearest near neighbor world. So to find out whether it's really a localization or not, we, we computed some localization measures here. Like the Shannon entropy, the inverse participation rate, ratio, and the return probability. So the return probability is simply mod psi zero square. What is the probability that the particle just stays there? And as you can see, that there is really a sharp spike here at g equal to gc. So as you go to, and this sharp spike becomes big. Uh, well, it's small. It falls off because amplitudes fall off, but still it remains sharp. And similarly, the inverse participation ratio also shows the spike, and the Shannon entropy shows a dip. So it kind of seems to suggest that there is a localization of speed that's happening at G to the GC. And in, okay. so, so far I just concentrated on what happens inside the causal structure, but interestingly, you will find that there's also structure outside the causal structure. And that's also quite interesting. That if I look at Xi now outside the causal cone, but we are very close to the front region, then you can find that here I'm not picking the CPD, I'm actually writing the phi itself, the scaled phi you will find that it can be actually written as, or it turns out that it is the derivative of what is called as a Fredholm determinant. So it is defined in terms of the kernel as determinant of one minus this kk. These are operators, I and mean, because kk now becomes an operator, these are some projections. And this also has a form here in terms of a function q, where q satisfies the nth, or q is the solutions of the nth member of the fine level two hierarchy of nonlinear differential equations, where n is this k plus one by two, our k is the familiar order. And here it's odd, so it means like k is equal to one, it then q1 will satisfy the pain level, the first uh, member of the pain level second order nonlinear differential equation. So therefore, outside the causal cone for the odd order fronts, the CPD, the scale CPD can be written as the derivative of this Fredholm determinant, which is that's what our stationary solutions tell us. And the Fredholm determinant, uh, okay, the, the kernel K is in terms of the airy kernels. And it's also well known that this Fredholm determinant F1 is a well known Tracy Vidom distribution for the level spacing distribution at the edge of the spectrum for Gaussian unitary modes. So essentially, what it means is that. Our scaled, C, uh, scaled CPD is very much related to the Tracy or the derivative of the Tracy Vidom distribution. Or we are actually seeing the same universality, which is described by the Tracy Vidom universality. Now, if you go to k equal to three, the third order front, then Q satisfies the next uh, member uh, of this equation, which is the fourth order differential equation, and its form of it takes this form. And F3 is then what is called as a generalized Tracy Vidom distribution. And if we looked at then the CPD now from our calculations, because the asymptotic structures of A3 here, F3 isn't given in terms of the generalized airy kernel, airy function A3, whereas F1 is given in terms of the usual airy function A1. But one knows that the asymptotic behavior of A3 is quite different from that of A1, so we expect some structure. And if we now look at our quantum work problem and look at what happens outside the causal cone, you find that if you're at a first order front, if there is just an exponential decay because the kernel just exponentially decays. On the other hand, if you are outside a third order front, then you find these additional oscillations which occur at a third order front. So 
Therefore, you find that there's a novel internal structure showing oscillations outside the causal cone at the third order front, which is in contrast with the exponential decay at the first order front. And again, I would mention that our numerics and uh, I mean, our exact calculations match very well with, uh, or with our scaling. I mean, the scaling points which you get from the stationary phase approximation. And I should also mention that the same Poincaré hierarchy occurs in multicritical models, random matrix models of n by n unitary random matrices, which are described by this partition function, Z, which is given by du. I mean, you're integrating over these matrices with this potential. And this is a polynomial potential, and it's well known. I mean, there were a series of papers because at that time people were studying this in the context of 2D quantum gravity. So there was a lot of studies, and they showed that if by tuning this polynomial potential, you can get a sequence of multicritical points. And the scaling exponents which they get there are exactly the same scaling exponents we get one by two. So therefore, it's very interesting that our very simple quantum walk problem on a one dimension provides a realization of the university classes of the GU multimatrix models. And we can ask the, why is it that we are getting this universality and universal scaling? It's essentially because of the fact that in the vicinity of the fronts, the energy and the velocity behave as omega q goes as q minus q star. This is the saddle point solution to the power of k plus two, and the v goes like this. So the scaling exponent simply depends on how we use manuscript. That's all it depends upon. It does not depend on any detail of the potential. And I should mention that the same arguments were given very recently, in a few years ago, by Vedusal, Majumdar, and Sher, where they actually studied the problem of age statistics for fermions in non harmonic trapping potentials of this form. And in fact, they also got, I mean, they mentioned that the, uh, in their case, there was a probability distribution, which they said was must have these kind of oscillations. In our case, it is a CP. And they also showed that the probability distributions can be related to this phenomenon determinants. So in some way, then our quantum work model is also equivalent then to, or is describing the universality classes for fermions in non-harmonic traffic potentials of this form. So the reason why, I mean, why does one have the similarity is that dynamically you can think of the front, see we have, one is having subdiffusive scaling here. So essentially why is the subdiffusive scaling coming? Because dynamically the front, because of this behavior that you, I mean, this of course comes because of the nature of the dispersion. So this is the behavior very close to the front. So it's really like dynamically you have a trapping potential, which is of the form exactly the same form. Say, for example, if you take order the fronts, then it's exactly like this. And they also conjectured that for um, if you have mod x to the power of n, where n is odd, uh, then in that case you should find a PRC kernel, and we exactly get that at our second order front at the transition point. And the interest in these kind of uh, problems is because of the fact that these are relevant in the study of BCs. Okay, so to summarize what we did uh, in, in the near the fronts is that we find universality and then you find multi-critical front scaling it's because of the anomalous subdiffusive scaling, uh, subdiffusive scaling and those amplitude functions satisfy higher order generalized hydrodynamic equations like the linearized KPV equation. And we also found a generalized hydrodynamical description for the correlation function in terms of generalized ARI kernels for odd order fronts and generalized PLC kernels for even order fronts. And we also found its interesting structure near odd order fronts that you have internal state case structures. While for, in fact, we now conjecture that one for any even order front, we should not get a local state case structure. That's what. And I should also mention that uh, one more thing that here, at least we never, we didn't find any tabulated values for the zeros of A3. For the ARI kernels, one knows the tabulated zeros. But here, in a way, you can say that the quantum work problem gives us a numerical way of an experimental way of finding the zeros of your generalized ARI kernel for A3. Not the kernel, I'm sorry, for the ARI function. And uh, to finish, uh, I will just conclude that what we've shown is that this very simple one-dimensional walk can, has a lot of interesting features with it. If I look at the long-time dynamics, firstly, it shows ballistic propagation leading to a causal-like cone distribution. And it's also interesting from the point of view of uh, quantum information that you have Q 
tunable bias transfer of information, although your initial state was unbiased. So you can tune it through the popping range and phase. Further, we have found that I can get an universal Euler type hydrodynamic description of the bulk dynamics. Then from the point of view of spin chains, you find that the quantum buff will provide hydrodynamic signatures of the quantum phase transitions. And then further, we can see that we have this very interesting universal multicritical subdiffuse of scaling near extremal fronts. And further, we show that the model falls into the same universe classes as that of certain multicritical random matrix models and pre polynomials in model. And finally, I must say that this whole problem is actually what, I mean, what I've actually done is nothing but the melting of a domain wall in a spin chain, extended spin chain, or in a spin chain extended with multi-spin interactions. So my CPV, which I got, and the CCDs, essentially what we've got is nothing but the magnetization dynamics of a domain wall in the extended spin chain. So I think that I'll stop here. I don't know. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. So I concluded my talk. So, any questions? Yes, I can ask a question. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is a clarification. Yes. Like, uh, can we associate quantum work trajectory as classical work trajectory? Pardon? Oh, can, you, can you repeat uh, your question, please? Uh, uh, you are talking about the quantum work. So yes. It means yes. it is a trajectory, right? Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, so my question is, can we associate quantum with classical? In this okay. case, we may violate Heisenberg uncertainty relation. All right. See, first of all, I mean, one should not call the quantum work. I mean, that's why I said that if I go back to my first cartoon, this is not a trajectory. Really. See, okay, I'll go back to the very first uh, cartoon. In quantum mechanics, I cannot talk of real trajectories. See, okay, let me go back to that cartoon which I have here. So here I do have a trajectory. The classical work okay but once i have quantum mechanics i do not have any kind of a trajectory because i'm describing my system by quantum mechanical wave function and if i'm describing the system by quantum mechanical wave function it means that i just have a superposition of all this so one really doesn't have a tragic a description in terms of any trajectory mm. so it's, it's like a term which usually people use quantum work so it is yeah, quantum work yeah, is simply that the propagation of a quantum particle on a network. So that's all one should one should think about it. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. A any reason why you are not using Wigner function as compared to modal square of wave function? Uh, okay. Here I because in this case you see I can actually obtain the wave function entirely. So why do I need to go to the Wigner wave function? But but I should also say that the local density which I mentioned is actually an analog of the Wigner wave function. Uh, one second, I should just show that. This one, mm -hmm. this row Q and T. So this is something like a Wigner wave function because it depends upon the position as well as on the uh, momentum. So I don't use it directly from the um, wave function because it doesn't give us actually any information and it's, it's not even uh, appropriate here. But this particular quantity really is something like the Wigner distribution. Thank you. Yeah, Duga, I have a question. This, uh, you know, in case of uh, NLSC, there yes. is something called this gray soliton. Okay. That was uh, gray soliton. Which okay. came out as a, you know, in case of Lie uh, model, it came out as the excitation of the Lie model, which was realized as a solid turn of analysis. Okay. Similarly, equivalently, are there extended objects here, which would be like solid turn equivalent of solid turns? See, what I believe is, I mean, this is a belief actually, uh, because hmm. uh, I'm, 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 I'm this is what I would like to understand a little better. See, when I said that there's an internal state the structure for the third order fronts or the, or the odd order fronts which is because of the uh, correspondence of the zeros. So essentially, I believe that 
and you're getting this some kind of a quantization. So yeah. somewhere I feel that uh, this particular one, if I have real zeros, uh, it is like I feel that there are solid fund like solutions then mm -hmm. for that uh, for those amplitude functions. On the other hand, if I don't have any kind of a real zero, then at least I mean, which I'm conjecturing for the even order, at least for the second order front, definitely we don't have. So then we don't have a solid form situation. So it appears like as if the odd order ones, I mean, this kind of extra structure is coming. I mean, somehow I think it can be correlated to the existence of some solid form kind of uh, solutions. But you know that um, connection, I have not been able to get it. I mean, I'm working. We are working on that actually to do a little bit more on that. Okay. Because uh, we got this yeah. radon determinant, so from there we want to uh, see whether we can make further conjectures with the and the Penleve hierarchy. You know, can you show me that equation which you showed in nonlinear equation? I'm just curious. Just go which back one? one step further. One there was a nonlinear equation which you showed. This one. This one. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, this one. So this is like more yes. general for any k. But, uh -huh. but these are linearized equations. These are the linearized yeah, yeah. linear equation. Correct. So what I believe is that for the odd orders, if you look at the corresponding, uh, I mean, for example, if I look at the corresponding KDV equation for it, this for the first order, then I know we have a solid term. On the other yes. hand, if I look at the second order version, I think this will become imaginary here, the coefficient. And then in uh -huh. that case, I will not get a solid term solution. So somehow I believe therefore that those the structures there are somewhere telling you about the existence of the solid one structures in the corresponding uh, yes. Uh, yes. nonlinear equations. Yeah. Very, very nice, very profound. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? See, Saurin has requested me to hang on here because he had just gone to some physics department for some immediate call. I see. So if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Duga. Very, very nice talk. Thank you, Durga. See you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. So, the, over to the organizers. Do you have any more announcement? Yeah. Yes, sir. So, we uh, this concludes the morning session and we thank the speakers for their time. And uh, we would like to announce a special uh, Industry Academy meet uh, from 3 p.m. today. Where a lot of speakers from different industries working in quantum field will be uh, talking about what is going on in industry field related to uh, quantum information, quantum technology. So do uh, do tune in at three pm. Yeah. So thank you all for joining. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.